There we go. Yes. All right. So let's talk a little bit about microscopes. So microscopes, one of the tools we'll be using a lot um, throughout the year, and microscopes are important. They're necessary for seeing um, things that are too small to be seen with the naked eye, and so microscopes came about in you know around the 1600s, and what had to be developed first of all were lenses. Okay, and that lenses made of glass at first. Um, are a key to telescopes and um, microscopes as well. And so microscopes weren't really invented until people perfected sort of grinding of glass lenses on um, producing these lenses that could provide uh, good magnification. Uh, they started as just simple microscopes where they just had a single lens oftentimes, like a magnifying glass almost. Um, and then though, they progressed in using multiple lenses to magnify an image multiple times and to get better resolution and so forth. <clears throat> Anton van Leeuwenhoek was one of the um, foremost uh, innovators of the microscope, and he made very powerful lenses. It's interesting, he was really secretive about his lenses that he made. He wouldn't tell anybody um, how he did it, and he wouldn't um, share that with other scientists. But he did make very powerful lenses. It's often called the father of microbiology. There's about nine microscopes that Leeuwenhoek made that still survive to this day. Um, and they were able to produce a magnification of up to 275 times. So that was very, very good at the time. Uh, he used his microscopes to look and find bacteria and discovered you know, that there was microscopic life that people were not really aware of before the microscope. He saw protists as well. He identified some organelles within cells, things like a vacuole, um, looked at muscle tissue as well. So Leeuwenhoek is one of the, the first people to really perfect the microscopes. And they didn't look like what you would think a microscope looks like. This is one of Leeuwenhoek's microscopes. It was really weird. Um, and what you have here is a tiny little lens is right here. And he made his lens, as we know now, he made he perfected making tiny little spheres of glass. So not sort of like a, um, a convex lens that you might be thinking, but these tiny little spheres of glass that he would mount. And you see this little needle thing here? You'd have to put a sample of the um, whatever he's looking at on that needle, and he could focus it using these knobs, and then you would look from the opposite side that's being shown through this lens to see this, this little object. So it doesn't look like any kind of microscope that we would be familiar with. It looks much different, but that's sort of how he started making those microscopes. Later on, Robert Hooke was another famous scientist that helped um, create microscopes. And you know, a lot of these, at this time, scientists were sort of multi-talented. I said here, polymath, somebody that's skilled in many different fields. And that somebody wasn't just a biologist, they're probably also a geologist and a mathematician. And um, people were very well-rounded, these scientists, and so they can, they can study various fields. Uh, he published this, this book called Micrographia in 1665, where he had detailed drawings of many of these things that he was looking at um, in his microscopes. He coined the term cell. And, uh, that's where we get that word from. So this is sort of what it looked like. <coughs> this is <coughs> his book that he published, you know, made by magnifying glasses with observations and inquiries, okay, by Robert Hooke. Okay, and he had, you know, drawings. These are drawings. I think I showed you these in seventh grade of cork. Okay, this is where the term cell came from. And so he made drawings of many types of insects that he was seeing under his microscopes and so forth. And so that sort of um, got scientists started really using microscopes. And this is what one of Hooke's microscopes. It looks a little more what you might think a microscope looked like, more traditional, where you had lenses um, separated by uh, a tube here. And so that's, that's what his, his uh, microscopes look like. So today we have a couple different microscopes that we will use. I'm not sure this is review. We have the compound microscope. Compound microscope uses light. It's a light microscope in which light passes through very thin sample through 
multiple lenses so that it's magnified. Okay. The compound lens, the compound microscopes that we use, this is for you to write now, made in red, has two sets of lenses that magnify the image. The eyepiece, the objective, those are the two lenses that magnify the image. We calculate the power, the total amount of magnification by multiplying the power of the eyepiece times the power of the objective. That gives us the total magnification. Um, you know, in, with a, a normal light, microscope, a compound microscope, the very best, you know, can go up to a thousand or fifteen hundred times magnification. Um, ours go up to four hundred, uh, and that's sort of stretching, you know, even at four hundred sometimes it's our, our microscopes are, it's difficult to see the various things, but they can, depending on the quality of the lenses, um, some types of microscopes use what's called oil immersion, where you put a drop of oil on the slide, and then you put on the highest power objective and the objective actually touches the oil and allows for greater magnification due to the refraction um, from that oil, but we, we don't really use the oil immersion lenses. Like greater magnification than 1,500? No, those, the 1,500 is with the oil immersion, usually. Um, you know, when you look at a, through a compound light microscope, because of the configuration of the lenses uh, inside the microscope, the image is inverted and backwards. So it's flipped and it's backward. These are the types of images you get from a compound microscope. Ours have a, a little pointing needle inside of them that you can rotate the eyepiece and, and point out various things. You see a round field of view when you look through them. Those are images to Then we have the dissecting microscopes, which I know you guys have used, which use reflected light rather than transmitted light, where light bounces off the object through the lenses. And this allows you to see opaque objects, objects which are not thin enough to allow light to pass. You can see them in the dissecting microscope. It's often called a binocular microscope. Usually it has two eyepieces, two oculars, giving you a good three-dimensional view of your object. They go up to about 50 times magnification. Ours go either 20 or 30, depending on which one you, you pick up. And, you know, they give you a three-dimensional view, a magnified view of the object that you're looking at. So let's review how we use the compound microscopes, because that's what you guys are going to be doing in your lab. First, we always carry the microscope carefully with one hand on the arm, one hand on the base. What you need, if you're, the lenses are all kind of fingerprinted or they have oil on them, whatever, you can use lens paper. You don't use paper towel if you have to clean the eyepiece or the objective lens. We have special paper we use called lens paper. It's just designed so it doesn't scratch the lenses. We always begin on low power. Okay, so we always start on the lowest power. For our microscopes, that's the red objective. We have the diaphragm underneath the stage. Okay. Okay, this dial that regulates how much light comes through. Usually you set it to the lowest setting and then increase as you increase magnification. You know, these microscopes are pretty bright. Oh, they're not charged. Um, so, um, those um, microscopes start with the lowest diaphragm setting, and then you increase it. Because they're pretty bright, and so kind of blinding when you look through the maximum amount of light through the microscope. I should say focus. Um, and then once we have our slide on the stage, we focus using the 
course adjustment, the larger of the focusing knobs. And once it's in focus with the course adjustment, then we can use the fine adjustment to make any fine tuning of that, of that image. We center the object. Sometimes with certain microscopes, you just use your hands to move it around to get the object you're looking at centered. With other microscopes, such as these, they have the mechanical stage, where you have these dials that move the, the, um, the slide left and right, forward and back. So it depends on what microscope you're using. This is called the mechanical stage. When you're ready to see things more closely to increase the magnification, you can switch to medium power. Uh, our microscopes is yellow. Okay. You need to make sure the objectives are clicked in. You know, sometimes you're like, between two objectives and you're not going to see anything. You have to make sure the objective you're using is clicked into place. And again, you switch to medium power, you focus again using the coarse adjustment, using the fine adjustment, you center again. If it's too dark, you can adjust the diaphragm to let more light through. And then eventually if you need to see the image under high power, you can switch to high power, the blue objective lens, the longest lens. And once you're there, you do not focus with the coarse adjustment, you focus only with the fine adjustment. Because you're not going to need to move it very much. Where our microscopes work, if it's in focus under low power, it should be under focus in medium or high power. It may need some fine tuning, but it should be very close. Sometimes you lose the specimen, right? When you switch to high power and then you can't see it anymore or it gets moved around or something. When that's the case, you can spend a long time just like scanning through and changing the focus. You're almost always better off going back to medium power getting the object, getting it in focus, then going back to high power. Because it's hard once you're on high power to really find anything again. A couple other notes here. Sometimes we'll have to make a wet mount. Remember, we have a glass slide, put a drop of water on it, we put our object there that we're going to be viewing, and then we cover it with a cover slip. We put our cover slip on, we put it on an angle to force any air out one side. We sometimes add a stain to our specimen, depending on what we're looking at. And these stains will um, be absorbed by different parts of the cell differently. And they allow certain parts to stand out, to be more obvious. Okay. Things like iodine is absorbed more by uh, DNA. And so it can stain the chromosomes and the nucleus so that it's more, it's clear where that is. Um, there are some types of dyes are um, make it so that the cell can no longer live. Things like iodine kills the cell. There are some dyes called vital dyes or vital stains that can stain certain parts uh, without actually killing the cells. So those are called vital stains. You know, here's just some, some things to, to look at. So this is the older style stage that just has two clips that hold the slide in place and you have to move the slide by hand. The, the microscopes we usually use uh, have the mechanical stage in which, like I said, the, the two knobs, one moves forward and back, one moves left or right. Now these are nice, but I will tell you, um, they break really easily. Like they're always coming apart and you know sometimes things don't move and things get bent. So they are nice because it allows you to just very smoothly move things around or move it a small amount, but sometimes um, they break pretty easily, so the stage clips are, are simple. As far as focus, this is a microscope that has a separate coarse adjustment knob and a fine adjustment knob. The coarse is the larger one, fine is the smaller one. Our microscopes have what's called coaxial focus, in which both the coarse adjustment and fine adjustment are built into one knob. So when you turn the larger part of the knob, that's the coarse adjustment. Okay. When you turn the smaller part of the knob, that's the fine adjustment. Okay. 
some microscopes turning the course and fine adjustment actually move um, the body tube up and down. Others move the stage up and down. Ours, our focusing knobs move what? Stage. Stage. They move the stage. Others would move this uh, body tube up and down. It doesn't really matter, it's the same idea. What you have, you're doing is you're changing the distance between the specimen and the lens, and that's how you focus. We have here the, the parts of the microscope that you're familiar with. The last thing is some units of measure. So when we're looking at a microscope, obviously we're looking at small objects. Um, what sometimes you may use millimeters for larger objects in the microscope, you may use millimeter. Our microscope field of view is about four and a half millimeters. But often we'll use micrometers as a unit. And there's a thousand micrometers in a single millimeter. When we're talking about cells and cell parts, it's often the size of various parts will be given in micrometers. That's the most common unit to be used when you're talking about a, a cell. There are units smaller than that, though. One micrometer and one tiny little micrometer, there are 1,000 nanometers. So when you uh, hear in the newspaper or watch the news and you hear about this nanoscale um, industries that are moving into um, SUNY Poly up near um, in Marcy, okay, they are working on things that work at the nanoscale, tiny little circuits and chips that are very, very small in this nanometer range. There are even um, smaller units, though, than a nanometer. Angstroms okay, are, are often used in chemistry terms. They are 10,000 angstroms in one single micrometer. So this is a tiny, tiny unit. You're not really using any.